Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Growing Together 2017 Winter Webcast Series. My name is Susan DeBleek, and I'm the Assistant Coordinator for the Iowa Master Gardener Program here with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. This is the third of the three-part series. I hope you've been able to come with us along this journey as we've learned about food security from a bunch of different angles. Thank you to all of our speakers. Today, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Ajay Nair about how to grow and harvest asparagus. And then we're gonna hear from Dr. Shannon Coleman about food safety best practices for our vegetable gardens. So we're going to talk about asparagus for about 60 minutes and then jump into food safety for another 60 minutes for your two hours of continuing education. Just a note that we do have a worksheet for you to follow along and take notes. We will have a couple discussion questions from Dr. Coleman. And also there's a link there to the online evaluation so you can tell us what next steps you're taking now that you've watched this webcast. Just a reminder to report your continuing education hours on the volunteer reporting system. These two hours will go towards your 10 hour requirement for staying an active master gardener. And if you're not a master gardener, we're really excited to have you and would love to share with you more about our program. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Ajay Nair. Hello everyone. Thank you, Susan, for having me. I'm uh, really looking forward uh, to this talk uh, uh, for this food security program, which is being uh, run by the Iowa Master Gardeners. Kudos, great job, you folks out there. Uh, a lot of impact out in the community. Really, uh, really uh, good. So uh, today, uh, uh, I'm going to give you an update uh, on asparagus production. Uh, my name is Ajay Nair. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Horticulture at Iowa State University, and I work in the area of sustainable vegetable production. Uh, as I mentioned, we will talk asparagus today. And the reason being, uh, in, in recent years, I have been getting a lot of calls uh, uh, from master gardeners, even commercial growers, about asparagus. Because uh, that's, the, that's the crop that brings promise, right? The spring comes and, and you have this small uh, uh, sprout showing uh, uh, out uh, of your uh, of the soil and that's this out here and it's screaming at you it's telling you hey it's springtime and and it shows a lot of promise so asparagus is uh, a very popular crop in the spring one of the first crops that's that is harvested and a perennial crop which means you can grow it year after year and and get a good quality crop which is highly nutritious and 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 sought after so you can see asparagus even even further uh, coming up. This is early in the spring, uh, those sprouts coming out. So I'll provide an update on the production, provide update on some insect, some pests and diseases, how to manage them, how to plant asparagus, and how to harvest it. Uh, and some of the uh, things you need to consider before you plant an asparagus uh, uh, plantation, even in your backyard or on a bigger scale. So uh, getting into asparagus, I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, 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 statistics uh, of uh, uh, asparagus production here in the country. So as you can see, uh, California is the number one producer of, Cali of asparagus, about 10,587 acres. Michigan is right behind 9,400. Washington, uh, 4,462. <laughs> and then we have this tiny, tiny number, and, and that's Iowa. Uh, 73, by no means uh, uh, big as California or Michigan, but, you know, we are slowly getting up there. And these are uh, some of the commercial farms that have reported. There are a lot of homeowners and master gardeners who might have an acre or two, which is not documented here. But still, uh, asparagus is something which can be easily grown here because we are blessed with some great soil. And I think we need to make use of the soil and grow more asparagus. Uh, bit into the botany about asparagus. The scientific name is Asparagus officinalis. And as you can see, uh, based on Roman writers, the, the, this, this crop was detailed somewhere in 200 BC. 
so this has this crop has been with us with humanity for a long time a lot of medicinal uses for example bee stings and heart ailments uh, i think on a large scale basis in us it's it started it started being cultivated in 1860 it's a monocot which means it's a it has uh, a two uh, it has one cotyledon it's a herbaceous perennial not many vegetable crops are perennial uh, asparagus being one of them the other one which a number of you are familiar with uh, uh is the rhubarb uh, and in case of uh, uh, asparagus you can see it's about a 20 to 30 year crop uh, and in iowa uh, a lot of it depends on where you plant it what kind of soil it is is it is it a a, a piece of area or piece of soil a, a field where uh, there is continuous water stag standing or is it well drained all those things are critical because if you try if you plant asparagus in a wet soil you can see wet is equal to short so which means a uh, short life so try to plant asparagus in a really uh, uh, good well drained soil and we'll go into that in detail in in coming slides it's a dioecious plant and uh, what that means is that uh, this plant has a, a an, indi an individual male plant and a female plant so there are two types of uh, plants male plant and a female plant a uh, female produces berries and that's the way you get to know or differentiate between a male and female and i'll show you the pictures uh, as we go on and they do pr uh, produce fewer spears than male so although we like to have male and female equal in every part of our society and aspect uh, but in case of asparagus it's a little different uh, uh, females produce less spears and and they uh, they do not yield as much now the growth cycle of asparagus i mentioned it's a 20 10 to 20 year crop and and this is a snapshot it's a complex slide here but what i want to show you that uh, 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 the asparagus during a growing season in the spring you can see these uh, the the first part spring and summer down here the spears start coming out they start growing and you you harvest them starting april uh and then as as the summer comes you stop harvesting so that the these spears can turn into ferns and this is the fern phase out here and the ferns photosynthesize produce carbohydrates for their own consumption for the use of development of the plant but also that carbohydrate is stored in the in the crown or the root down down in the soil and as the season progresses when we reach summer and autumn majority of the photosynthesis and the carbohydrates which the plant produces goes into the crown of the root system which is absolutely critical and necessary because next spring uh, the the vigor of the spear the yield of the crop will totally depend on how robust and vigorous the crown or the root was so it's it's critical to know how the life cycle uh, of the, of the crop so that you understand because your management decisions could affect the health of the plant uh, uh, and, and that could in direct in that could directly affect the the yield so uh, uh, plants you can see the the picture behind this is sometime in the middle of the summer uh, the spears have grown to become ferns uh, and they are healthy and green out there uh, they are actively photosynthesizing uh and they replenish the crown carbohydrates they're sending it down uh it requires a dormant period in the winter uh, or a dry season and then as i indicated it's a perennial plant 12 to 15 uh the reason i put out 12 to 15 is for commercial production systems that's what maximum the crops are grown for and then they would take it out and and put a new crop or, or rotate into a different planting uh but otherwise plant can grow up till 30 years okay now the interesting part so you have decided that you want to plant asparagus now that that is the decision making time of what cultivar what should you plant so uh, if you look at some uh, older literature uh, these cultivars for example uh, mary uh, martha and waltham washington uh, these are these were the cultivars that were very famous uh, but they were non hybrid uh and uh, in 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 modern production system nowadays we don't recommend planting them because we have newer hybrid cultivars that have improved vigor they have a high degree of disease tolerance and they pro they produce higher yields um uh, and so uh, we have kind of come out of the older mary washington martha washington walton washington cultivars and gone to newer cultivars and newer hybrids uh that uh, uh translate to a, a robust crop and, and a heavy uh, yielding crop so uh, going back to the point of you know you have to, you have to decide the cultivar which we will talk more in detail but uh, between the male and female why do you want to plant male plant uh, and not a female plant 
The reason being, the male plants, they live longer. Uh, they emerge earlier in the spring, so which means you can start harvesting early in the spring, and they don't produce fruit which compete for resources. So the way you recognize a female plant is that later in the season, when the ferns have come out, uh, later in the season, cl at, at close to fall, you'll see these red-colored berries on the plant. That means that it's a female plant, uh, whereas the males do not have berries. Uh, uh, males also lodge less than females. So in case of Iowa, uh, you know uh, wind could be uh, really howling at you uh, early in the spring, late in the fall, and uh, the, these winds are damaging and they can actually lodge the plant, just lay the plant flat. So females lodge quickly uh, or, or relatively easily than the female one. Uh, and again, uh, 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 males don't produce seeds, uh, and that can, uh, which actually can pr uh, produce unwanted volunteer seedlings. So, if you had a patch, which you in which you had female plants, you will see between your rows there'll be new asparagus plants that are coming up, and that's because of these berries falling into the ground, the seeds falling into the ground, and a new volunteer plant coming. You don't want that plant in there, but it just comes up. So, with the males, you don't have that problem of having a volunteer plants. Uh, the picture here showing you the female plant, and you can see these red colored dots here. Those are the seeds or the berries, fruits, the berries. So this is a female patch. Uh, we don't want it, but uh, I mean, in older times, like for example, the Mary Washington, Martha Washington cultivars, it was a mix of male and female. So you had you had uh, female plants. Uh, more numbers to to show the uh, the difference between male and female. So the first column here is showing you a product uh, from uh, fif 50 male plants. This is the yield. Uh, and then a uh, product from 50 female plants. And as you can see at the end, total for the season, the last row here, 38.1 uh, pounds from the male plants, whereas only 25.5 from the female plants. So again, this is the reason we want to plant male plants because they yield higher. Now, uh, getting uh, more into the cultivar, uh, these are some of the commonly planted cultivars and commonly available too. Uh, as you can see, most of them start with the word Jersey. Uh, Jersey Giant, Jersey Prince, Jersey King, Jersey Knight. And the reason Jersey name is there because all of them were developed at Rutger, Rutgers University in New Jersey. And so that's why you have the Jersey name. So Jersey Giant, it's, it was the first all-male hybrid, you know, high yielding. It's widely adapted. Spears are a little small, but still uh, uh, a commercial, uh, highly planted commercial cultivar. Jersey Prince, it's adapted to heavier soil. So let's say you cannot avoid planting asparagus in, in a sandy. Uh, you want a sandy soil or lighter soil, but let's say uh, a soil is a little heavy. Then maybe instead of Jersey Giant, it's better you use Jersey Prince. Jersey King is also a great cultivar, large percentage of large diameter spears. Jersey Knight is high yielding. So you cannot go wrong with these Jersey series. And then University of California also uh, introduced some cultivars, for example, UC-157. Uh, and you can see they, they yield good. Uh, but in Iowa, you know, the, you ha you have, we, have, we have seen thinner spears uh, than the newer hybrids from the, like the Jersey series. So it's still okay, uh, but the sp spears are a little uh, smaller and, and thinner. Uh, this is a picture to show you how different the cultivars could be. So uh, this is a plot uh, from the uh, uh, western part of Michigan, uh, from Hart County. Uh, they grow a lot of asparagus there. Uh, while I was at Michigan State, you know, had a chance to visit a lot of asparagus farms and growers. So th these are two cultivars. On the left-hand side, you see Guelph Millennium. And on the right-hand side, you see Jersey Giant uh, from the Jersey series. The one is from Rutgers. The Guelph Millennium is from Canada. And you can see a big difference. These were planted at the same time. And picture taken, you can see uh, the Guelph Millennium, they are early senescing, which means they are turning yellow early in the fall, whereas the Jersey Giant are not. So what does this mean? This means that the Jersey Giant plants are still photosynthesizing and producing carbohydrates and resources that will be sent to the crown and that will make the crown more vigorous for next year. So between these two cultivars, uh, if I was to choose, I would choose Jersey Giant. Uh, and the Guelph Millennium is a little less drought tolerant, uh, although the reason the Guelph Millennium was developed for more uh, tolerance to colder temperatures. Uh, and we have seen some advantage in that area. So big difference between cultivars. Now, this cultivar, I'm sure this is a home garden novelty, uh, this cultivar called Purple Passion. 
Uh, it's sweeter, more tender than the green one. Uh, that's definitely a plus for it. Uh, larger, but fewer spears. You know, you will have large spears, but few of them. And they are low yielding than jersey. But again, you know, it's it's that asparagus which is a little bit different than others. So people go for it or people grow it just for the reason of its novelty. And it's it's a good cultivar. We have grown this here in Iowa with, with huge success. So uh, no problem at all in establishment and growing. But, you know, you get fewer spears. Uh, but it's an interesting cultivar to look at. Purple passion. Uh, now let's get into the production methods uh, of how you start an asparagus patch if you if you plan to do that. So number one and the most critical part is site selection. You need to ensure that the soil is well drained, uh, preferably towards the sandier side. Uh, the pH is between six to seven. I put six point seven to seven. Six to seven is good. Uh, the higher you have the pH, like near the six point five seven the lesser incidence of fusarium. And fusarium is a soil-borne disease that can, uh, once it's there in the soil, it's very difficult to eradicate it. And in the case of asparagus, which is a perennial crop, uh, you don't want fusarium because you are not going to remove that asparagus there next year. That asparagus is going to be there for 15, 20 years. So try to be with a higher pH, be in the higher pH soil. Uh, avoid previous asparagus production area, for example, in your backyard, in your home garden. If you knew that there is, this is an area where there was asparagus in the past, I would try not to plant my second planting in there. Because in asparagus, there is something called the uh, 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 replant suppression, which means uh, the older asparagus, which was there for 10, 15, 20 years, has produced so many uh, uh, compounds and there might be pathogens which affect the establishment of the next uh, planting. So avoid uh, mm -hmm. previous uh, asparagus patches. Definitely don't plant in, in areas and spots where you have seen perennial weeds. Uh, uh, for example, you know, nut sedge or Canada thistle, you don't want your asparagus to be there because it's going to bring down the yield and, and, and weed, weed management will be a nightmare. Uh, and, and before you plant, make sure you apply enough phosphorus and potassium because that's applied only once and, and that's it. You don't apply it on a regular basis. Nitrogen you do, but not P and K. And, and we'll get into that into those basics soon. Uh, asparagus can be uh, uh, you know, established uh, with seed, uh, with transplants, but those are more of areas where more research is, is going on. With seed, the problem is that it's usually slow. A low percentage of germination, Trans transplant, as I said, it's possible, but the research is still going on in that area. But the uh, most common way of establishing asparagus is using crowns. What are these crowns? These crowns are one or two year old roots or plants, uh, by far the most common and the most reliable way of establishing an asparagus uh, uh, field. So in this example, this is a picture. Again, this is from the western part of Michigan. It's huge. Uh, in terms of uh, area, they plant uh, uh, hundreds and thousands of acres of asparagus. And if you look in the picture, you can see the crowns lying down there. Uh, they have made some trenches in which the crowns will be planted. Uh, but uh, we'll take a closer look at the crown. So this is what a crown looks like. Uh, uh, lots of roots, uh, vigorous and thick roots, uh, nothing dying, very fleshy. This is what a crown should look like when you plant. So this would be a two-year-old crown. Now, uh, if you look at the root system of asparagus, pretty deep. Uh, this, this is from a six-year-old plant. Uh, each block represents one foot square. So you can imagine it can go almost 10, eight, 10 to 12 uh, feet down. Uh, it can really go deep into the soil and tap for the moisture. So very deep-rooted crop. Now, uh, uh, this is again an, another picture here. I, I'm holding this crown in my hand. Uh, you, you can see how it looks like, uh, pretty healthy, a lot of vigorous roots out there. Uh, uh, another picture here showing you uh, uh, some examples of what the crowns look like, some good ones and, and some bad ones or not so good ones. So if you look at the top line, these are the cr you know, crowns that are not that heavy, not, not many roots in there. Uh, whereas if you look at these crowns at the bottom, this is what we want, really vigorous. You will have a really good crop uh, uh, establishment when you use uh, crowns with heavier biomass. So uh, planting size, top row, too small. Middle is all right. It's not that bad. It's all right. And, and in some cases, when you order from uh, online or, or from vendors, you might get what's in the middle. Uh, but the bottom ones are the best. Uh, a planting arrangement, you know, uh, we plant asparagus about uh, uh, in rows, and each row is about five foot uh, apart. 
uh, and 16 and the spacing within the row is about 16 inches between crown some may plant even a little closer like uh, maybe 8 or 12 uh, but the closer you go uh, the spear size decreases so from 6 inches in row uh, high yields from 6 inch but the closer you go it's not good so i would say anywhere from you know 8 to 10 is a, is a good number uh, as a good spacing within the row uh, typical production system, so you have this one-year-old or two-year-old crown uh, that are planted about 8 to 10 inches deep uh, in a furrow. So you, in the spring, you make a furrow and you place these crowns about 8 to 10 inches deep. Uh, no harvest occurs in year one, which is the year you planted, or year two, the next year. Uh, spears are allowed to fern out. You don't want any spear to be taken. Just just let it fern out and store that carbohydrate and just build that biomass. Year three, spears are harvested for about two weeks, uh, not more than that. You don't want to harvest uh, continuously for about you know four weeks or six weeks. You just want to harvest two weeks and you just leave the spears, let it go to fern. Because again, the objective or the idea is for this fern to photosynthesize and send the carbohydrates and nutrients back to the crown. Year four and beyond, harvest occurs from late April through mid-June, uh, depending on the weather. So here you see uh, what I just mentioned. Uh, uh, this is the planting. This is the way it should be. So l let's say in the in the, in the figure below, you see the first A, which is we made a trench, A A4 to 12, I would say 8 inches deep. Put your crown. Uh, that's the planting crown. Immediately after planting, just barely cover the crown. Several weeks after planting, the, the crown, the fern will start growing. You just slowly keep pushing the soil in. And at the end of the season, you completely fill the uh, trench and you can see the ferns coming out. So this is how it should look like. And the picture above, is, is the, it shows how uh, the crowns are planted uh, in these furrows. Again, uh, a closer picture uh, to show you here that we have two rows we planted. So it's, you don't have to stick with one row. There are growers who would increase the spacing between the row uh, uh, to maybe from five to even eight or ten feet. And they put two rows of uh, uh, crowns in there. In this case, you can see we are putting two, uh, but one is also okay. And then uh, most of the time we apply water through drip irrigation or subsurface. You can see this black color tubing going there. That's the subsurface drip. Uh, in your backyard, you know, you, you don't have to do that. You can water it. You, you are in a place where the water is easily accessible. But on a bigger scale, it's good to have some drip system there so we can establish the crop uh, in a better way. Same plot. So I'm going back. This is the picture uh, of how uh, we planted, and this is how it establishes later. This is, you know, probably the second year or so, uh, second or third year or so. But you can see the, the ferns have grown, and they look really healthy. Fertility requirements, as I indicated earlier, a phosphorus and potassium uh, addition, not that effective, uh, but it's good to apply some in the beginning. And uh, uh, for that, before you even plant, the first thing what you have to do is to Soil sample. Se take the soil sample, send it for analysis, know what the status is, and based on the, based on the current levels of P and K, we can recommend what amount of P and K need to be added. Uh, so it's very important because it gives the soil test will give you soil pH, EC, cation exchange capacity, organic matter, a lot of things. So it's critical that you do the soil test before you apply before you decide where to plant your asparagus. Uh, after that, uh, after the planting. Uh, if, you, if you have applied P and K in the beginning, you don't need any P and K anymore. Nitrogen is enough. In Iowa, we usually recommend about 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre uh, prior to harvest uh, in the spring. And then after the harvest, which means after the last harvest, you apply another 45 to 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Again, these numbers are per acre. You have to calculate um, your area and, and, and do the math. Uh, but nitrogen is primarily the... the uh, nutrient it would you would need uh, after the establishment of uh, asparagus harvesting uh, usually as i indicated not harvested for two seasons to build the crown harvested every 2 to 5 days depending on temperature and and you know it right i mean when it when the temperature is high uh, the, the spears grow really fast so the harvest interval will reduce harvested at about 7 to 10 inch height april to june is the standard time six to eight weeks for mature stand and usually stop half we stop harvesting when the spears are you know half of the spears are less than three by eight in in diameter but again uh, typically you would pick late april to maybe the 
June, beginning, mid June, and so that will be about 20 picks or 22 picks. And after that, you let the fern uh, and the spear fern out. Harvesting, it's better to snap the spear uh, than cutting it with the knife because if you start cutting it with the knife, then if there was a disease on one spear, it just keeps spreading from spear to spear or plant to plant. So it's better to just snap it uh, a little bit above the uh, soil surface. Wash with cool water or a cool or store at 32 to 36 degrees Fahrenheit, high humidity. We don't want any moisture to be lost from the spear. Also, research has shown that the greatest amount of fiber formation uh, in these spears happens 24 hours after harvest. So if you harvest and you just leave it on your counter for 18 hours, 20, 24 hours, your asparagus spear will be more fibrous and more stringy and not as you know soft and crunchy as you want. So cool as soon as possible after you harvest. You can wrap it with a film wrap, a moisture pad, uh, or you can put the butt end of the asparagus in, in a bowl with water. And that's how you see when you go to grocery stores. They, they put it nice or they put it in water. Uh, and the bunches vary from anywhere from 7 to 10 inch long and weigh about half to 2 pounds. Uh, it's, and I'm sure everybody loves to see asparagus in the spring when they go to their closest store, high Fairway, fairway, wherever. Uh, we love to see that asparagus. Uh, this is the, just to show you a picture, you know, this is this good time to harvest. This is just right, nice and, and tender uh, looking spears. Uh, snap the spears slightly above the ground. Again, snapping is better instead of knife because you don't want to spread diseases. Uh, uh, late summer fall, as you see, you can see the picture behind, ferns grow after harvest, they provide the carbohydrate, and then later on, short days and cool temperatures trigger storage and dormancy, and that's what's happening in, in October, November, December, the plant is going dormant and sending all those carbohydrates into the roots. Ferns die off in winter, and you know some growers, again, commercial scale, they would plant a rye cover crop in the fall just to uh, promote uh, uh, a sustainable practice because you don't want soil erosion to happen. Uh, the cover crop holds the soil in place, adds organic matter, and also acts as a as a habitat for beneficial insects. So, asp asparagus has got quite a high nutrient value. It's a good source of vitamin A, uh, vitamin C, folic acid, and fiber. And uh, <laughs> as this picture shows you, ew. <laughs> Why does your pee smell so bad? So I bet a number of us have, have would have gone through this experience where you have had asparagus and you go to restroom and you get this smell. And, and that's because of this sulfur-containing compound called mercaptan. It's a fun fact here for you. Uh, that's what makes the urine or the pee smell uh, that odd and unique uh, smell. It breaks down in the when you eat asparagus, it breaks down in your digestive tract to compounds that have distinctive odor, and and that's what is called the asparagus urine. Uh, ability to produce compounds may depend on your genes. So, for example, forty six percent of Brits or, or people from Britain produce asparagus urine, and uh, only only forty six, whereas hundred percent of people from France produce that. So I don't know who did that research <laughs> of looking into all the peas, <laughs> but you can see 46% in Britain and absolutely 100% in French. So when you go to France and you eat asparagus, I'm sure everybody's going to smell alike. <laughs> Pest management. This is important because uh, asparagus is a uh, 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 as I indicated, uh, a perennial crop, again, 20, 30 year. And it's important that you keep the pest at bay. Don't allow them to come and start damaging your crop. And some of the commonly seen pests or insects in asparagus are asparagus beetle, cutworms, and aphids. Uh, weeds are also a problem, but let's focus on the insects first. So asparagus beetle, cutworms, and aphids. Uh, cutworm feeding, so this is what it looks like. What the cutworm does is it, it uh, climbs on the spear and starts eating one side of the asparagus spear and soon you will see the like a goose neck uh, a pattern on the spear so this as you can see the arrow showing this is where the cut worm feeding was and so this tissue is gone so the spear turns into a goose neck and this is what it look like in the field you can see this asparagus here up here all here are being affected uh, by the asparagus uh, uh, beetle Asparagus beetle are of two types. Uh, there is a spotted and a common. 
uh, overwinter as adults, uh, two to three generations in a year. So they quickly uh, reproduce. They lay eggs on the spear tips, and as I showed you, they they eat the spear. Uh, tips and 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 then it's unmarketable. Uh, nobody will buy that. Uh, so harvest regularly for control. Don't delay your harvest. Uh, and during the fern stage, also they can uh, they can affect the crop. So the larva would chew strips of green material, uh, and then what we recommend for for spray purposes, for commercial purposes, if there are five to ten adults per ten crowns, it's time to spray. Uh, we have to take some measure to to bring their population down. Another insect is a uh, European uh, asparagus aphid. Uh, it's most serious pest in the Midwest. I mean, aphids in general are a problem. Feeds on ferns after harvest. Does not feed on the spear. So it's not pro no problem with the spear. But again, if the ferns are affected, then then your next year's crop is, is being affected because uh, ferns have to produce the compounds and uh, carbohydrates to send it to the uh, crown. So if the ferns are affected, uh, not good. Uh, it overwinters on the fern. Uh, ferns become dwarf, like a bonsai effect. Plants are, and then and then the plants become more susceptible to fusarium and other soil bond diseases. So uh, we have to make sure we manage the the insects. And for homeowners, you know, uh, uh, there are products available. You know, neem oil can be used uh, against insects. That's the more safer way, more sustainable and more environmental friendly way of managing. You know, spinosad. It's also an OMRI listed product, organic product. You can use that. Uh, and if let's say seven, uh, neem oil and spinosad are not working and the and the threshold is really really high then maybe go for some chemical products and you can buy seven uh, malathion or permethrin uh, as uh, and they, uh, as a control uh, measure and uh, uh, insecticide and they do a great job i mean the sprays will take care of the insects Getting into diseases, uh, Phytophthora is a big problem in asparagus. I mean, if you look at the population or the acres of asparagus in Michigan, uh, uh, they were higher than what we see now. And the problem, the reason they are lower now is because of this disease caused by Phytophthora. So once Phytophthora is in the soil, uh, it's, it just decimates the crop. The crop, as you can see in this picture, you can see this crown becoming yellow. Spears becoming yellow, so it's reducing the vigor, and ultimately it will kill the plant completely. Uh, it, it's long lived in the soil, uh, yellow brown crowns, and uh, ultimately the crown will die. So we do not want absolutely any kind of fight of or fusarium in the soil because in the long run it is going to completely decimate your crop. Another problem which uh, has been uh, 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 mentioned quite a lot in in the eastern part of Iowa, in Illinois, uh, is is this. A disease called the Cercospora spot caused by Cercospora. Uh, this leaf spot, uh, the disease causes the leaves of asparagus to die prematurely, and which can result in premature plant death. Again, anything that affects the crown I, and the fern will affect the crown, and the plant can be completely killed. Uh, you can see the lesions here. You know, see these oblong lesions on the on the uh, uh, on the fern and surrounded by darker margins. Uh, if you see something like that, you can manage it using fungicides. You know, some of the easily available ones are Bonide, Orthomax, Mancozeb. Uh, if you, they, these, the, these sprays will, will help you effectively manage these. So don't delay. If you see some symptoms, you have to immediately act on it because once the disease gets prevalent, uh, it becomes difficult to manage. Another disease is rust disease. Uh, you can see uh, in this case, uh, this is the this is the spear, uh, or, or the or the bottom of the fern, and uh, you see these uh, uh, spores or, or uh, type here. This is the uh, fungi, rust fungi, uh, and the best way to avoid this is to plant resistant cultivars. You know there are a number of new cultivars like the Jersey series which are resistant. Uh, make sure you plant uh, uh, in a way that they are uh, the 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 plant is well spaced, and the rows are oriented in the direction of prevailing winds. That's because in that case, it maximizes air movement and facilitates drying after rain, uh, rain uh, comes. So uh, uh, that will help. So don't put your plants too close just for the sake of having more plants. If you keep it too close, number one, the spear size will go down and then there are more chances of diseases coming and attacking because there'll be high relative humidity uh, in closer plantings. Uh, in the end of the season, if you see rust or if you have seen rust in the past, mow and disc the brush in the fall. So in the f fall, uh, a lot of growers, uh, homeowners, don't do anything with the uh, 
uh, with the fern. The dead fern just stays there. It's it's actually not bad actually because the uh, fern will catch the snow and insulate the crown. Uh, but if you had rust, then it's better you mow and disk it under in the fall. You don't want the uh, uh, spores to be there, the inoculum to be there, and the rust coming back again next year. Okay, so uh, the uh, next challenge uh, when it comes to uh, asparagus uh, uh, are the weeds. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, you can see uh, this uh, field uh, kind of has been totally taken over, <laughs> totally taken over by the weeds. And you don't want uh, your asparagus field or patch to uh, uh, look like this. Uh, again, productivity is lost. You look at the weeds there. They have been producing seeds in, in millions and millions of counts. And uh, there's a big weed seed bank that is built in there. So even though you go and manage the weeds this year, you come back next year, uh, those se weed seeds will emerge. Again, the same problem. So don't let your weeds go to this stage. Uh, this is very difficult. Uh, you cannot uh, fight this. Uh, I have seen uh, or heard some growers uh, or even homeowners sometime using salt uh, for weed management. Uh, uh, that spraying salt will kill the weeds and, and not asparagus. It might be true for one or two years, but if you keep doing it year after year, the high salt concentration will affect the soil quality. It will uh, affect the soil really bad. You know, the soil loses its structure and that again affects the emergence uh, and the and the health of the plant. So you can see uh, this patch, this experiment in one patch, there was salt applied as pre-emergence. You can see how it looks like. Most of the asparagus is kind of brown. It's here, right here, uh, brown. Whereas the one which no salt, they are still doing fine. So uh, don't just use salt to manage weeds. Uh, the uh, uh, best way to manage weeds is to just go in and hoe and, and remove the weeds when they are small. Uh, if you, I mean, if you are operating at a smaller scale, uh, there is no need of using any fungicide. You can just use a hoe. So, uh, uh, for uh, uh, pest management, uh, uh, for weeds especially, uh, the f the best thing you can ever do is to Make sure you plant your crop in an area uh, where uh, there are no weeds to begin with. Uh, so relatively uh, uh, free of perennial weeds, uh, uh, clean up uh, year prior to planting, you know, if you are going into a new patch. Uh, and uh, once you have planted, uh, then, you know, just, just hand hoeing, uh, removing the uh, weeds when they come, when they're small. Uh, you don't let them go to uh, uh, seed. Uh, because uh, uh, weeds create a number of problems. Number one is the weed seed bank, and they also uh, you know, provide a habitat for those insects, so those asparagus beetles, those aphids, to come and hang around. And if they're around, I'm sure they're going to get your asparagus as well. So hand hoeing uh, regularly uh, uh, is, a, is a good way. And also, again, don't let the weeds go to seed, because otherwise uh, the problem uh, gets uh, compounded. So uh, I think I kind of gave you a good idea in terms of you know some of the uh, planting methods, uh, row spacing. As again, as I said, uh, five feet uh, between rows and about eight to ten inches within a row. Enough ventilation, and you use crowns. Uh, one thing I did not mention: uh, while you plant your crown, make sure you do not uh, injure your crown or, or chip your crown or, or bruise your crown because you don't want any. Uh, pathogens in the soil to find an entryway into your crown and affect your plant. Again, this is a perennial crop. Uh, once disease is there, it's there. We cannot eradicate it. We can manage to a certain extent, extent but try to avoid it. So you got, we pro hope you get some, got some information of planting, uh, how to harvest, uh, storing. You know, you don't want you want to cool the crop as soon as you harvest because uh, otherwise the fiber formation is, is accelerated, uh, the tenderness is lost, the juiciness is lost, the crispness is lost. So you harvest it and some of the uh, pest management measures uh, uh, to manage uh, manage uh, weeds and uh, insects and diseases. 
Now, uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, folks uh, who have helped me uh, in, in 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 past years uh, to conduct some of the research with asparagus and collect information and for publications. Christine New, my graduate student, John Cra- Ray. Uh, Ray Cruzy, Dana Jokla, Brandon Carpenter, now Maria Belenki, a new grad student, the ISU farm and, res- and farm superintendents, uh, extension uh, extension colleagues uh, and staff uh, uh, who have helped me in the field, a lot of on-farm trials, and also the funding agencies. For example, the Iowa Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association, Practical Farmers of Iowa, for more collaboration and hosting field days and, and connecting with the growers. IDALS, Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, and the North Central SAIR. Uh, all these organizations and entities have provided us funding or support in some form so that we can continue uh, doing, the, uh, the, doing the work across the state. Uh, this is my uh, info. Uh, anytime in the future, uh, if you want any information about asparagus or any other vegetable crop, feel free to contact me. My email ID is up there, N-A-I-R-A-J-A-Y at iastate.edu. My phone number is there. And and the bottom you see uh, uh, two uh, links. First one is my lab webpage. First one is the blog. We we have a blog in my lab, grass students, myself and all, we blog uh, uh, once a week and in summer it's a little less uh, it'll catch up now in the winter we are more in the office but any interesting thing we find any disease you know any event or any any operation any anything interesting about vegetable production we 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 blog uh, we put a post out there and the second link is my uh, uh, lab webpage extension.iastate.edu slash vegetable lab and Uh, That is where, uh, that's a repository for all extension publications, research reports, peer-reviewed articles, uh, graduate students, uh, events, field days, workshop, all the information is posted up there. So if you need anything to know about any crop, it's it's up there. Uh, uh, I would like to put a shout out that there is a publication we released uh, for asparagus. So if you go to the extension store, Iowa State University extension store, and put asparagus production in the search, you will find an extension publication. And uh, you can download that. All that I have presented to you today is there more in more detail in that, in that extension publication. It covers a lot. Uh, nutrients, insecticide disease, a harvest, uh, everything, a lot of pictures also there. So feel free to go there and download that publication. There are other publications there too, you know, melon production, pak choy production, uh, you know, pepper, uh, different crops and different soil proper publications on soil uh, are all available uh, uh, on the extension uh, store. Or you can go there to my lab web page as well. So with that, uh, thank you very much. I hope uh, I was able to provide an, a nice update for you uh, when it comes to asparagus production. I know as the food security uh, uh, program with the Master Gardener as it expands, there might be, and I think Susan did mention that uh, some of the uh, uh, respondents did mention, food pantries mentioned that one of the crops they would like to see in, in pantries would be asparagus. So, again, here you go. So now you know uh, how to manage your asparagus in, in a more effective and, and uh, uh, profitable way and productive way. Uh, I hope this in, you can utilize this information and grow some good quality asparagus. Uh, uh, and again, as I said, we are blessed with some great soil. And so let's make use of that soil and, and grow more food and, and let more people uh, eat more fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, With that, thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to interacting with you all uh, sometime later. Uh, 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 I wish you a great uh, uh, summer for next year and uh, see you around. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. Now I wanted to hand it over to Dr. Shannon Coleman. Welcome to Best Practices for Garden Food Safety. My name is Shannon Coleman, and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition in the area of food safety and consumer production. My research background involves rapid detection of foodborne pathogens in fresh produce from the environment's environmental sources. Here's a brief overview of the topics we will cover today. 
We will first go over um, background information on food safety and fresh produce. We would then talk about be- best practices, um, pre-harvest, during the harvesting, and post-harvest. Moving on in to background information on food safety, let's start off with some facts. In 2015, there was a report from the USDA that stated that foodborne pathogens imposed how much in billions in economic burdens on the U.S. public every year. I will give you about 30 seconds to think about it. All right, time is up. So how much in billions did it cost the U.S. public each year? The answer is $15.5 billion. In a report by Hoffman and others for the USDA Economic Research Service reported that 9.4 billion illnesses imposed over $15.5 billion in economic burden annually. This report shows that foodborne illness is not just a burden on patients, but it also costs a lot of money annually in services as far as visiting the hospital. There's loss in wages. There's loss to the company that the the person works for, and there's loss in money for that actual food company. So this is why we take the conversation of food safety so important, especially with the economic burden. Each year, approximately 48 million people become ill with foodborne illnesses in the United States. In only 20% of these cases, 9.4 million, the same number we just talked about with that billion dollar burden, can be can lead to specifically identified pathogens um, that lead to these illnesses. Over 90% of these cases are caused by 15 known pathogens. It has also been estimated that 46% of foodborne illnesses in the United States from 1998 to 2008 are attributed to the consumption of fresh produce. As producers of fresh produce, we want you to make sure that you're aware of the risk of such pathogens. So when we talk about food safety, we are considering contaminants. And there are three types of contaminants to consider, biological, chemical, and physical. As you prepare to share with these food pantries, we want you to keep in mind the the important role of the type of contaminations that may occur. So most foodborne illnesses are biological contaminants. An example of a biological contaminant is bacteria. And salmonella is commonly, is one, it's the image that is shown here, and it's commonly linked to outbreaks with tomatoes. The other two contaminants, physical and chemical, are also considerates that you should also consider for your work as well. As far as chemical, the chemical contaminants are, um, could be your cleaning agents or pesticides, and a physical contaminant could be a glass particle found in a jam or jelly. And in your case, that could be a plastic that broke off from a tool or your harvest container, mixing in with peas, strawberries, any small type of um, fresh produce that you harvest. And so you want to make sure that you keep all three kinds of chemical contaminants out of your final product that goes to the pantries. So going back to the biological contaminants, which are could be of these three categories, bacterial, 
viruses or parasites and fungi, they can be found in various places throughout the environment and in food. And humans may also transmit them. Unlike plant and animal cells that are made of a million cells, bacteria cells are single cell organisms that are commonly examples of that are commonly found in foodborne outbreaks, linked to foodborne outbreaks. And as I mentioned before, one common um, foodborne pathogen that is associated with foodborne outbreaks, especially fresh produce and tomatoes, is salmonella. The smallest organism that exists is viruses, which is needed to help, which need helps from a host to replicate. And a common example in fresh produce is um, hepatitis A, which has also been linked to fresh frozen strawberries this past year. And then finally, we have viruses. Both vi- virus, both viruses, bacterial and parasites are all unlikely to be seen with their naked eye. And going back to the parasites themselves, they do not grow well in food. And they can be transmitted through to food through humans. So someone has to be ill and their contact with that food, which then comes in contact with a, a vulnerable population, can lead to their illness. Even though I just mentioned that these um, type of microorganisms are not seen with the naked eye, there are some parasites that can be seen with the naked eye, such as intestinal worms, which has to you, if you've grown up um, around lakes and creeks, you're, there is a possibility of them being found in those sort of situations. Harmful microorganisms or pathogens have been associated with fresh produce since the early 2000s. And the outbreaks are increasing as we go. And it's not that everyone has bad practices. It is that the surveillance of these foodborne pathogens have increased over time. As I mentioned before, I worked in the area of rapid detection and there are more detection methods coming out that are specific to certain foodborne pathogens and you are able to identify them within hours where using typical culture methods, it can take over a couple of days to identify the foodborne pathogens. There have been several recent multi-state outbreaks invo- involving several states. And as you can see here, you can see some fresh produce that have been linked to these outbreaks. One that may stick out to you is cantaloupe, which, which was involved in the 2011 multi-state outbreak that was linked back to Colorado and the Rocky Ford area. There are some that are now becoming more popular or you've heard more about recently, such as hepatitis A that was um, not too long ago linked to pomegranate seeds and also this past summer linked to hepatitis A in frozen strawberries. And as you can see here, foodborne illness and produce is growing is a growing concern and you want to make sure that you're in, that you follow the best practices so that you pre- can prevent an incident with foodborne pathogens. So who are at risk for foodborne illness? Well, the target population that is receiving the fresh produce from this program are generally considered as the ones who are at risk. And that target population considers and involves young children, individuals with immune deficiencies, older adults, and pregnant women. So as you grow and prepare the produce from your gardens, we want to make sure that you follow safe practices at, from the garden to the pantry, making sure that we have safe produce in our local food pantries. So how can a contamination occur with fresh produce? So here we have a diagram here that shows um, the many avenues that fresh produce may become contaminated. And one source that I studied a lot in my research is irrigation water and processing water. 
and they may come in contact through intrusion of domestic and wild animals or poor hygiene of the workers. Other factors to consider along the way, especially in large popu- large um, production facilities, um, contamination may occur during harvesting and transportation, during processing and packing at the distribution center, or even once the produce gets home. Even though you're growing the fresh produce and you're probably in safe practices, we also have to make sure, and I think the SNAP Ed and FNET program has also have handouts that give the consumer at the end use proper um, signage and proper handouts that talk about how they should practice um, washing and storing the fresh produce at the proper level and storage standards. Being aware of these risks are very important at all points of contamination that may occur. Now, I know at this point you're probably panicking. Well, maybe I shouldn't grow this fresh produce and maybe I shouldn't donate to the food pantry. But you should because even though, as I mentioned before, that there has been an increase in outbreaks, there has also been an increase of surveillance of these foodborne pathogens. And that's what also makes the U.S. food supply the safest food supply. And there's also governmental agencies that are monitoring every part of the food systems to make sure that everyone is following safe practices. So if you come in contact with anything, there is somewhere, somewhere, some, somewhere and somebody there to stop, um, and have, and cause a recall. So you have to follow those same practices that they follow in the food industry. And so, this in this webinar we will go through practices of food safety from garden to pantry in this webinar today we will cover basic hand washing techniques how you should wash your produce how you should clean your food food contact surfaces and how you should if you're using any type of refrigeration keep the fresh produce away from raw food commodities such as meat, raw meat. So one way to put your standards into place is to develop a food safety plan. So the Extension and Outreach has um, fact sheets available that talks about a food safety plan. It is on the food safety website for Extension and Outreach. And what a food safety plan do is it is a roadmap that actively reduce risk of safety that may jeopardize your product safety. The plan includes several check mo- checkpoints, monitoring mechanisms, changes that should be made, and other ways to improve your product quality and safety. There are six components of a food safety plan that are listed here. And although um, some of these that may not um, relate to your garden itself, there are some parts in here that you can develop and set up for your garden to help those that are working in your garden and the volunteers to be prepared and know how you want them to follow your plan as far as far as producing safe produce. And some of those things could be volunteer training, which telling them on how they should wash their hands and how they should clean their utensils and the harvest bins. Water management, making sure that they use an approved source as far as watering your fresh produce. Produce handling, making sure that once you harvested the produce that you are washing and getting rid of the dirt and other um and other contaminants that may be on the surface of your fresh produce. Having a cleaning and sanitation plan of your utensils, of your gloves, of your harvest bins. And if you have, if you have livestock or live animals or d- domestic or any other animals on your, um, on your 
farm or near your garden, having a plan as far as crisis management, making sure that your garden is away from having the risk of runoff, either from the livestock or either from later on, we'll talk about the portalettes and making sure if there's an incident with that. What is your plan of action to make sure that the the fresh produce don't become contaminated? So here is a sample of what should be involved in that food safety plan. So in your steps one and two, you want to list your your pre and post harvest handling standards that you've set. And sit down and think about how you want to identify your quality and your safety risk that may be associated with your fresh produce. Then you want to come up with monitoring and measuring the risk routinely. And then in case of something happening or occurring that you weren't expecting, how you would modify these practices to reduce or eliminate risk. And at all times, having a way to document each change in step. Now we're moving on to the best practices pre-harvest. And we're going to first talk about pre-harvest practices as far as personal hygiene of your volunteers and having the right facilities overall for the volunteers and other gardeners in your community garden. So volunteers' hygiene and health are a major concern in the spread of foodborne pathogens. As we saw before when we saw how fresh produce can come contaminated, poor hygiene, such as um, hand washing technique, could lead to someone at the end becoming ill if they consume a contaminated fresh produce item. So all volunteers and gardeners must attend regular training, focusing on good personal hygiene, so making sure that everyone is showered and clean and wearing fresh, clean clothing. Although you're going to work out in the field, you want to have that clean clothing because that is another way of transmitting pathogens into the area. You want to also have hand washing training and designated trainers for something simple as hand washing. They must also be trained on how to hand, handle cases in which their uh, Ill, injury or illness may occur. So if someone makes a mistake and cut their finger, you should have a plan of what, what should happen if they have already been come in contact with the fresh produce, how you're going to segregate that area from the other, isolate that area from other areas that may become contaminated. And if someone is ill, they should not be working in the field. As I mentioned before with those viruses, they are transmitted through humans to the food itself, which is then transmitted to someone else. You can easily make someone sick, not even with these foodborne viruses, but something as simple as a common cold can be transmitted through touching something and not having the proper practices. So if you're ill, stay at home and do not go and work in the field because you don't want to make anyone else feel ill either the other workers or the end users of this fresh produce you also want to have proper and appropriate signage on hand hygiene and washing all over your facilities that will keep as a constant reminder on for your volunteers and gardeners to wash their hands and those type of signage can be found on the extension website it is available and it is free um, for you to print off and you can put it over your hand washing stations. You can put it in where everybody checks in. So as it could be a quick reminder of why they should wash their hands before they go out and work in the field or come in contact with the produce at all. When it comes to hand washing and the toilets, you want to make sure that you, number one, have a clean facility that is maintained with all the proper supplies. You want to make sure that that toilet facility is in a available location to everyone who's working in the garden. So if you're at a community garden, making sure that the community center is open, that is near it so that they can so that people may go and use the restroom if needed. And if you have a portalette, having it close enough that the gardeners can go over and use it, but 
Also, we're going to talk about later and next we're talking about making sure it is in the isolated area away from your growing area, your production area and your handling area. In case of an emergency, if something happens with that porta potty, you want to make sure that it's in the area where it can be clean and that the um, fecal material that is in that area does not spread into your garden. As I mentioned, or this is a time to mention that most um, feces is a is a common transmitter of these foodborne pathogens. It is commonly found in the feces of animals, and it doesn't make them sick. And as a way, um, and humans also excrete these um, foodborne pathogens in their feces and other biological matter. With your toilet and hand facilities, you want to also make sure you have a way to maintain your gray water system and that you're collecting it in an isolated area. And as I mentioned before with these porta potties, you want to make sure that you have an emergency plan in case of a spill. High winds that we have here in Iowa could lead to these um, facilities falling over and you want to make sure that the material that is in there does not trace back into your garden. You want to also make sure that you clean and service it in the isolated area. And then make sure that you have enough toilets and hand washing stations for all of the gardeners involved in your, um, in your garden. Cornell University Farm Food Safety Team developed a, um, hand, a pamphlet that talks about infield hygiene. And this is available in Spanish as well. And it is a series of comics that talk about hygiene in the field um, from t um, using the restroom at an appropriate facility, washing your hands before you eat and before you go out in the field. And so I think it's a great tool to be used to explain hygiene to others. Today we're going to take a break right now and we're going to do a Windows 2 activity. And the purpose of this Windows 2 activity is for you to engage the brain of the learner and to develop your own habit of mind that will encourage you to gather and seek your own information, identify emotions, make connections, think critically, respond in wonderment and awe, and imagine the possibilities. So as I mentioned before, we want you to take personal hygiene and health very important as you are growing something for a vulnerable population. So you want to make sure that you're not spreading any of these bad pathogens to that audience. So available at your site where you're listening to this webinar is an activity sheet that you will use for the next couple of minutes to do an activity involving the Windows 2 activity and the image that I will show you. You will first get your fact, your sheet and look at it and you will fill out the information section. What is this image trying to tell you and what is important about this image? Then you will write down your feelings of your own on what observations are you feeling and how you want to engage that information. Next, you will write out questions that you need to know that will help you better understand or new questions that come in mind that make you ponder this phenomenon. And then you'll write out ideas of how you will spread this information out to everyone else that will work in your garden and how you will relay this message to the, the other volunteers and gardeners in your at work area. So here's our graphic. In the graphic, we have a worker or a volunteer that wants to use the restroom not too far from where they have been working out in the garden. And the two workers say to him, don't pee there, use a toilet. And the person says, why not? It's not hurting anything. So sit there and review the image for about two minutes and write down your thoughts. Now, I want you to turn to a small group or to your neighbor 
and discuss this image and discuss how you're going to go back to those in your community gardens and discuss this topic and explain to them why they should not be involved in this type of activity in your community garden. So take another two minutes to do that. Finally, engage in a group conversation with the entire room. Discuss your thoughts. Come up with unique and innovative ideas of how you will relate to others about their hygienic practices and explain why it's a bad idea to use the restroom out there in the middle of the field. So take about two minutes with that. All right, moving in on to discussion of our activity. So poor hygienic practices will lead to the transmission of foodborne pathogens. So diseases such as foodborne pathogens can be spread in three ways. Through, through the source of infection, so coming from um, the human itself, then going down to a susceptible host, so in the image that we see here, we can have the human and due to poor hand hygiene or poor water management that could lead to the soil itself and the plant itself becoming contaminated. And then if you have a contaminated plant itself, that could lead to the animals becoming ill. We're going to talk about this later and talk about it a little bit now that most of the animals, especially livestock, carry a lot of these foodborne pathogens. E. coli in cows and salmonella in chickens, and it doesn't harm them any bit. But when it when a person becomes infected, a human, it could cause serious illness and even death. So that's why you want to take precaution and make sure that you have the proper hygienic methods that you use before going out in the garden. Another thing to consider is the environment. So if that person in that image used the restroom in that environment, does someone tape it off that no one can walk through it? At that moment, if they used the restroom right there in the middle of the open area, someone can track or animal can track whatever um, that biological function into the garden and lead to the to the products itself, the food items becoming ill and then leading to the result of someone else becoming ill. So that is why you should have proper facilities for people to wash their hands, for, for them to use the restroom at all times um, in your garden. We're going over to the next part of best practices pre-harvest, and this is on the production end. So in this section, we're going to discuss water quality, manure use, and animal presence. So for water quality, first you want to make sure that you're using approved irrigation and spray water source. So some approved sources could be the municipal water, treated water, or groundwater. If it's coming from a well, you want to make sure that it has a cap and it's in good conditions. You also want to make sure that you're monitoring your water if um, your water is coming from a particular source and make sure that it does not have any settlements in it, such as soil. As we just saw in the previous in image and the other image that talked about how fresh produce can come contaminated, soil is one of the sources that bacteria loves to grow in and could lead to contamination of a fresh produce item. So when we talk about rain, when we talk about water quality, we also want to talk about rain barrels and food safety. Now rain barrels are a good way to conserve water and it's also highly recommended to use for land and ornamental use. And if you're going to use rain barrels, you need to make sure that you're following your city's restrictions as far as the use of rain barrels. But it is not recommended for 
fruit and vegetable gardens. And this is due to the fact that these waters could potentially carry um, E. coli and other disease-causing human pathogens. As I mentioned before, birds or chickens or any other type of wild animal can carry these foodborne pathogens. And then if they excrete feces on the roof and then rain runs down the roof and the those bacteria pathogens are now and viruses and parasites are now in your rain barrel and could le- could then spread to the fresh produce and then lead to illness. There are also chemical hazards, as we talked about before. Um, in the development of the roof, they did not have c- um, come in or think about the consideration that, hey, people may want to use rainwater on their fresh produce. So there are several chemicals that are used to make roofing material that if consumed, it could cause a hazard to others. So it's a big no-no to use rain barrel water, fruit and vegetable gardens. Moving on to your irrigation water, you want to make sure that you use drip irrigation on your crops. And drip irrigation is recommended because um, it reduces the risk of cross-contamination of your fresh produce because that water is... um, going down directly into the produce itself and it reduces the risk of splashing. There's also um, a particular temperature recommended when you're rinsing off your fresh produce. You want to make sure that your water is slight, slightly warmer than the produce that you are rinsing off because you want to prevent thermal shock and absorption of water and bacteria into the pores of the produce. The FDA recommended um, for tomatoes that the wash water be at least 10% warmer than the tomato temperature to prevent infiltration. Cold water causes air cells in the tomatoes to contract and create a vacuum, drawing water into the tomatoes. Contamination in the water or on the equipment can include bacteria, viruses, parasites and fungi such as yeast and mold all of the foodborne the type of contaminants that I've mentioned to you before in addition to spoilage and fungal contaminants it can raise the pH of the tomato and improve the conditions for the bacteria to grow so pH is one of the um Factors that bacteria love to grow, and if the pH is is increased or decreased even for some of them, um, it creates a perfect environment for these foodborne pathogens to grow. And as I mentioned before, with this contraction, you are then allowing the bacteria to go inside of the, for in this example, we're going to use a tomato plant. And once the bacteria is inside of the tomato fruit itself, there's no way of washing or sanitizing it or doing any other type of method to reduce those level of foodborne pathogens. So there are other um, considera- there are considerations that um, you must consider for those who are using manure. So I know at the demonstration gardens um, there you're likely not to use manure. But those who are growing in your own home, there are practices that are considered in the industry that the FDA have set that um, most of the growers in industry have to follow. And so we want to take this time to let, let you also be aware of those practices so that if you are using this, you want to make sure that you follow the proper practice. So that's going from making sure that you follow the directions that are on the label of the manure itself. There um, is a rule set for manure use that you have to apply it at least 120 days prior to harvesting. So you cannot pick any um, ready to harvest produce prior to 120 days. So there's been research done 
that shows a reduction in the levels of the E. coli um, or any other foodborne pathogens after those days if it's used properly. Also, you want to consider using a cover crop as a boundary. And then for those who are growing on their own area, you want to make sure that your fresh produce um, garden is away from possibility of runoff from livestock. So in that last image, you see there water coming from a facility that holds that looks like dairy cattle. You want to make sure that your garden is not sitting right there below that because if it is, then that's where you are then putting yourself at risk and putting your final product at risk of becoming contaminated. Also, you want to make sure that only tree, fruit, and bushes and field foliage um, come in contact with manure and no manure on your side dress of the produce crops in the field. Next, we're the, uh, I'm going to talk about animal presence in your garden area. As mentioned before, um, contact with wild and domestic animals could lead to the spread of pathogens in your garden area. As I've mentioned before, and I'll mention it again, a lot of these animals carry these foodborne pathogens and could contaminate your fresh produce. So you want to make sure that you're eliminating the the risk of their product coming in contact with these animals, such as restricting their their access into your garden. So you can use a fence of some type with some type of wiring, making sure that it's small enough that the smallest rodent cannot get through. You want to make sure that you do it weekly express inspections of rodents. So that's looking at your, your fence to make sure that they've not eaten through your fence. Making sure that you're checking the produce itself to make sure that it doesn't have any bite marks. And you want to make sure that you're monitoring your animal activity. So looking for footsteps and any other um, type of indicators um, feces in your area to make sure that you're not spreading or that they are not coming in contact with their garden. And you want to make sure that you reduce all type of attractants in your area. So making sure that you're um, putting something up that will keep them away from that fresh produce because they're tending to want to eat it. So putting up, finding a way to keep them um, not interested in your area itself. So let's take a break to discuss um, your recommendations for the type of, of containers that you should use to grow in your gardens. So you want to make sure that you use a food grade material or commercially produced product containers that can be used to grow food in. So examples is using containers that are made of porous materials such as the wood is the wood that is there. You want to make sure that that wood has not been treated with a chemical that could lead to a chemical hazard for you. You can use five gallon buckets to grow your fresh produce in. If you're if you live near a high V or any other bakery type situation, Ison comes in big five gallon containers and there's probably a lot left over from there so why not use these five gallon containers to grow fresh produce that is more nutritious than that than the icing that previously lived in there and then at that point then you know that you're using the food grade container so maybe reaching out to a local bakery to see if they have any containers that you can use leftover containers that you can use to grow your food items in and then you want to make sure, as I just mentioned when I talked about the porous materials, that if you're using any type of lumber or any other type of plastic, you're making sure that you're not using one that is treated with a chemical that could cause um, harm to humans. You want to make sure that this plastic can withstand the outdoors, so making sure that it can withstand rain and wind and all that occurs in the summertime and hot temperatures. And then 
Although it looks very nice to use truck tires as a source for um, growing items in, I would suggest that you use it on ornamentals and not your fresh produce. Those um, tires have chemical compounds within them that could lead to someone becoming ill if ingested. Now we're moving on to best practices during harvesting. And we're going to talk a lot about sanitation um, in this area. So when it comes to harvesti harvesting itself, you want to make sure that you are getting the most marketable fresh produce that is out there that you would also find in any grocery store. Um, we do want you to harvest all produce that is ready to be harvested, but we want you to separate out the marketable versus the unmarketable in their own container. I would even recommend those same five gallon containers, putting the unmarketable in those five gallon containers and uh, uh, moving them well away from the marketable fresh produce. You can use it for composting or any other use or just disposing of it, but making sure that it does not mix in with your marketable produce. And we're going to talk about quality as we move on, but there is an issue with those as far as spoilage um, foodborne pathogens that reduce the quality of that fresh produce that is um, not healthy for um those who consume it and it reduces the quality and the taste of that fresh produce and it's just not healthy for the other produce that is um that is marketable or safe to eat um if they come in contact with the spoilage um or the unmarketable type of um fresh produce so you want to make sure, too, that you separate out the bruise and, and drop produce. So that is what we're considering unmarketable. Um, for those who are at the farm, you're also participating in the citizen science part of the um, research for this program. So you want to make sure that you weigh it, but making sure that it's in its own separate container away from others. Um, but making sure that you have a proper plan for it, such as um, disposing of it or using it for composting. So here should be your plan of harvesting. So before you go out to harvest, you want to make sure that everyone has washed their hands properly. You want to make sure that all your harvesting aids, which is your harvesting lugs, your containers, your buckets, your utensils have been cleaned, rinsed, and sanitized. You also, with one another harvesting aid you want to pay close attention to is your gloves, your gardening gloves. You want to make sure that they're clean frequently and that they are ready to go every time you're ready to go harvesting. I have... Um, with a mentor of mine, we took gardening gloves that are dirty and haven't been cleaned in a while, and we used it on a medium that is used to grow um, pathogens on. And we pressed just pressed the, the gloves on the surface, and we allowed the um, the the medium to go and incubate for 24 hours. And the many different forms of those contaminants and microorganisms that were found on the pr on the surface of that medium would surprise you. Um, so that's why you want to make sure that you clean it. Because although you think it's just dirt, there are other things that can harbor within your gloves. So you want to make sure that they're clean. And you also want to make sure that you're using new, and cl new or clean containers every time that you harvest. So making sure that everything is cleaned out and ready to go um, when you harvest and when you come back and set everything out for, um, for the pantry, making sure everything is in a clean, um, clean container. So to make sure that everything is clean, you want to make sure that you use food grade sanitizers. So the extension has a fact sheet 
online that is free as well that talks about cleaning and sanitizing guide and it talks about the type of cleaners that you should use such as iodine hydrogen peroxide quats and organic acids can be used to clean all of your utensils and your aids you just have to make sure that you use the proper kind and at the proper concentration you want to make sure that your sanitizer you use is approved for food contact and once again, making sure you use it at the proper concentration. And if it has a expiration date on it, making sure you dish that you discard it and change the sanitizer as needed. So finally, we are at the best practices post harvest. And in this section, we're going to discuss handling produce, the cooling the storage and packaging materials that you should use. So as far as harvesting and storage, after you post harvest, you wanna make sure that you first um, remove the soil from the produce and you wanna make sure that you cool it immediately. So you can use a cold room, you can use an air conditioned room, you can use a shade space, but you wanna make sure that you're bringing down that field heat immediately. So we're we'll talk about field heat um, coming up later in this webinar. You want to make sure you um, store your fresh produce in the controlled temperature that is recommended. We'll talk about the controlled temperature for um, five of those fresh produce coming up. And wherever you store your fresh produce, you want to make sure that it is cleaned out frequently and that you inspect for rodents or an or insects or anything else that can intrude and um, bring down the quality of your produce and could lead to the, um, the proper medium for bacteria to grow, pathogens to grow. So why is cooling so important? Cooling is important because cooling is used as a way to reduce the grow or reduce, reduce the grow of microorganisms. So, the temperature of your refrigerator should be 41 degrees or below. And that is a critical temperature for bacteria because it helps minimize the growth of it. Bacteria love to grow within what is called the danger zone, which is between 40 and 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you want to make sure that especially for your perishable food, um, fresh produce that need to go in some form of refrigeration immediately. You want to make sure that you keep it out of this danger zone. And bacteria pathogens grow very rapidly and respiration can occur between 70 and 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Field heat is what we're basically trying to reduce um, once you harvest your fresh produce. And you want to make sure that you come up with a plan to for field heat reduction in harvesting. So that means taking very frequent and often breaks during harvesting to make sure that you're getting your fresh produce out of the field as soon as possible. And so what is field heat? It is the combination of heat absorption in the plant tissues from the environment prior to harvesting, and the heat can result in rapid respiration occurring in a still warm plant tissues. So going through the whole um, action of post-harvest cooling can suppress enzymatic de degradation, which means that it could redu reduce the softening and respiration activity of the fresh produce. It can slow and inhibit water loss, such as wilting. It can also slow and inhibit the growth of decay producing microorganisms such as mold and bacteria coming in with both of those spoilage and pathogenic microorganisms. And then finally, it can reduce the production of ethylene, which is used to ripen as a ripening agent to minimize um, or minimize commodity reaction to ethylene. So let's put best practices in field heat reduction to practice. In this um, activity, you'll give you'll be given about 30 seconds to think about a scenario to write down your own individual responses of how you would want to reduce the field heat 
in, in a scenario that could be similar to your community garden. So here we have scenario number one. You have a community garden that has access to a fridge. Take about 60 seconds or so to write down how you, what best practices you will use to reduce field heat. Time is up. Moving on to scenario two. You have a field garden that has that has access to an air conditioning building. You have the next 60 seconds to write down what best practice would you use to reduce field heat. Time is up. And then we have our final scenario. You're at a community garden that does not have access to a fridge or a building. Write down your best practices you would use to reduce your field heat. Time is up. Listed here are your three scenarios and what best, best practices you should use to reduce field heat. So the first uh, scenario, community garden that has access to a fridge, I would go every so often stopping frequently to take in a bunch of fresh produce that has been harvested and take it to their fridge and try to reduce the field heat immediately. So you want to make sure that you are um, reducing that respiration and ethylene production that will happen for the um, fresh produce immediately using that um, form of, um, of, of using um, refrigeration as a form to, of reduction. The second um, scenario, I would take the um, every so often stop 
um, and take the fresh produce in and put it in that refrigerated area or a room designated for your work to make sure that you're getting the fresh produce in and reducing the field heat. For those who don't have access to neither a fridge or a building, I would take the fresh produce into move it into a shaded area to help um, in field heat reduction. There's, it is also recommended in the summertime when you're using coolers to also use a blanket. So if you have an extra blanket around to cover it, that can also be used as a shade in the shaded area to help bring that temperature down of that fresh produce. Now we're moving into produce storage um, recommendations. So on the Extension website, there is another free fact sheet available to you that has all of the uh, recommendations for fresh vegetables um, that are available. And then the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about um, five of the fresh um, vegetables that were grown in the garden last year and will continue this year and how the you should, uh, what type of quality you should um, be looking for and storage recommendations. So first we have onions, whether red, yellow, or white. You want to make sure that the quality of the produce is blemish-free, dry, shiny, firm, tightly closed neck. And you want to make sure that you store it in a loosely woven bag in a cool space, dry area, and dark area. As we just talked about, we want to reduce the respiration of these fresh produce. So you're going to hear a lot about blemish free and you want to hear a lot about dry and dark places. For bell peppers, you want to make sure when you harvest them, you want to make sure they're firm, bright in color, heavy for their size, with no brown or soft spots. Those brown or soft spots are indicators of spoilage. And both in spoilage organisms and foodborne pathogens can harbor in those areas. As far as storage of the bell peppers, you want to keep it in refrigeration for three to four days. For potatoes, you want to make sure that they're firm, smooth, they have few eyes, few blemish, no sprouts, no soft spots, or green coloring. Both the sprouts and green coloring are indicators of toxins that may be present in your um, tomato, the potatoes, and they um, could make you ill if you um, consume them. So that's why it's always recommended to remove those sprouts and green spots before consuming. So as far as storage, you want to keep it in a cool and dry place for up to two weeks. And you want, as I've just mentioned, with those green areas and those sprouts, those toxins that are present in them can make you ill. So you want to make sure that you trim those away. Next, we have tomatoes. And this is... Next, we have tomatoes. You want to make sure that they are firm, fully colored, plump, green stems with no brown spots. Remember, brown spots are an area of spoilage. And you want to make sure that you store them stem down to help reduce that ethylene release or production. And you want to keep it at room temperature because refrigeration can cause flavor loss. Our final product is cucumbers. You want to make sure that they're firm, deep in green color, well-shaped, small to medium size, and you want to make sure that they do not have a soft or yellow spot. Once again, an indication of spoilage. And you want to make sure that you store them up to one week in refrigeration. As far as your storage and, ma and packing materials, you want to use food grade containers. You don't want to use non-food grade containers because of the possibility of chemical leaking or um, coming in contact with that fresh produce that is typically consumed raw. So you don't want to make someone ill with the chemical contaminant. 
And then you want to make sure that that container can protect its integrity. Using some type of harvesting lug or using a cardboard that has reinforcers in it are good things to use as far as your storage and packing. And you want to make sure if you're using something that can be clean, that it is clean very often and frequently. So once you bring the fresh produce back, cleaning the containers is a good recommendation to use. And then finally, you have grown the fresh produce, you have prepared it, you have harvested, you have prepared it to go to the food pantry, and now it's time to go to the food pantry through transportation. So you want to make sure that you take precaution through making sure you go through all your steps um, and using those same practices when you go during transportation. So you want to make sure that you're keeping this fresh produce at the proper temperature at all times. So you may have to turn on ref- on your air conditioning in your car to make sure that you're not um, exposing the fresh produce to any high or hot temperatures. It is recommended also to use covered vehicles to transport your fresh produce to the pantries. Having the fresh produce exposed and out to the open air during transportation could lead to those um, birds and other animals that wanted to come in contact with the fresh produce come in contact with it, and it's not a, not a controlled environment. And then, as I just mentioned, you want to maintain the proper temperature to help reduce the respiration of the fresh produce. So I hope you all enjoyed this presentation. Um, The main takeaway from this presentation is that we want to make sure that you are producing high quality and safe produce that is being donated to the food pantries. And you want to consider food safety at all points from garden to the pantry. So you want to make sure that you have special precautions such as hand washing during pre-harvest You want to make sure that everything is clean and you're using safe practices in the field during harvesting. Post-harvest, you want to make sure that you are cleaning and stacking and storing your produce at the proper storage level. And even during transportation during the to the pantry, you want to make sure that you're following safe practices that this produce at no point becomes contaminated. Listed here are the various references that I used throughout this presentation. And this is the conclusion of the presentation. Thank you.